for me, uh, lateral surgery's um, been a great journey. Um, and uh, I remember learning how to do actually lateral surgery on my way back from New Zealand. Um, I had uh, uh, stopped by and um, uh, was in a lab in San Diego with Dr. Pimenta. And um, actually, it even goes further back than that. I remember I was in a NAS meeting, I think in 2001, something like that. It was in Seattle. And uh, I remember, you know, um, at the time, uh, there were some, you know, Pat Miles, and there's a bunch of other people that were um, Keith Valentine. And, um, but it's come a long ways. And part of what I'd like to talk about today is I know we've had some great speakers um, in general, uh, and we've talked about lateral surgery, but, um, and here are my disclosures, is for me, what was intriguing is, you know, being a neurosurgeon and, and wanting to do spine surgery, there were so many cases where, you know, we had to do so many different procedures, and some of the, some of the cases that we would do were very challenging, so you have a case like this, um, and traditionally, you would do something like this all posteriorly. You'd have to take a lot of the facet joints. It'd be an all-day operation. You know, when I was a resident, um, this was an all-day case. And in fact, we staged these in Virginia um, when I was a resident. We would open, put the screws in, and then come back later and do our inner bodies. And so... I was always very interested in, and I wanted to do, I was one of these residents that was very interested in doing spine from the beginning. And so when I started learning about these other procedures like lateral, to me it was the ideal approach because it's, the blood loss was minimal. Um, there was, uh, um, you had great access to the disc space. Um, and then the thing that kind of threw me off, being a neurosurgery resident, I didn't really understand you know, a lot of the uh, uh, anatomical um, structures. So, for example, you know, when you're a neurosurgery resident, I mean, yeah, we kind of saw the psoas sometimes, you know, when you're doing a thoracolumbar approach. Um, the kidney, you didn't really, you know, you didn't really know where it was. You knew it was a retroperitoneal structure. The vasculature, you know, I mean, there's all these things. It was almost kind of scary, you know, like the diaphragm. Um, and so when I started doing lateral, I really, I, I knew I had to understand the anatomy because the only people that know what the retroperitoneal space is is urologists, right? I mean, nobody else goes in that area. I think the only other time... Uh, uh, I remember as a resident, I think one of uh, there was like a shunt catheter that that got you know twisted up and ended up going in the retroperitoneum. But it's just not an area that we're trained in. And then one other area that we're not trained in is is the chest cavity. So we all go, oh yeah, there's the aorta, there's the vena cava, but that's about it, right? But it's actually fairly complex. You have the diaphragm. The diaphragm's relationship to the retroperitoneum, you have very important structures that go through there. Um, and so it's good to understand this. Um, and again, usually, you know, when you're a neurosurgery resident, you don't know that much about the visceral pleura, the parietal pleura. Um, and more importantly, uh, I remember when I was studying for my uh, board exams, you know, you kind of had different anatomical textbooks, and they all had different versions of what the lumbar plexus looks like. So that's um, uh, Gray's anatomy version of the lumbar plexus. And you can see, actually, this is a very nice um, uh, dissection done with one of our fellows in the lab here at SSF. It looks totally different, right? doesn't look anything like the textbooks. And then depending on what textbook you have, they have some, some better um, images, but again, nothing like what you would see in real life. And just like the brachial plexus, you know, um, when you're learning these um, anatomical structures and trying to memorize things for boards, it makes sense the way they have it. It's like, you know, they've got the trunks, the branches, you know, you try to kind of make sense of everything, but that's not what it really looks like. And then when you're doing lateral surgery, 
you're, you don't really see the nerves because you're working through a small tube. And so um, you don't, you, you kind of know that they're, they're there. Um, and then uh, this is a nice um, illustration. Actually, this is a um, uh, pelvic screw. This is a picture of some of the uh, nerve roots going anterior the spine. Um, and so you really have to start thinking about three-dimensionally um, you know, when you're doing lateral surgery, you have to think about the iliac crest, you know, where's, for example, if you're in the thoracolumbar junction or, you know, if you're at L2, you know, there's the kidney. Um, so all these things start to become an issue. And this is a very good CT neurogram uh, that was done. And you can see how complex the um, neuroanatomy is. And this is a cadaver. The cadaver never does justice to actually what and how many of those nerves are present. So we started to, uh, about 15 years ago, collect really good data. Um, I think we ended up, there's probably about 50 anatomical specimens we use. This is just one of the fellows. Um, we put some guide wires into the different branches of the lumbar plexus. So you could see what that looks like on an AP. And then here's what it looks like on, on a lateral. So you can see if you're going to do a lateral approach, it's pretty daunting to try to figure out, um, you know, to try to get so you don't get a nerve injury. Um, and again, we did a lot of different studies. And what we found was is that the lumbar plexus is really fixed to the spine. So you're not really going to be able to retract it a lot. Um, and this is the... Uh, uh, psoas muscles dissected off. This is the L3-4 disc space. But you can see the relationship to all the different um, uh, structures. And you can see the interconnections as well. Um, and this is something that the textbooks don't really talk about, um, is you know that relationship. And you can see it's fairly fixed. You're not going to be able to you know, move that retractor. So if you're using neuromonitoring, and you feel like you're on the plexus, you, you take the retractor back out, you redock, and you get a new trajectory and a new um, uh, position. And to understand this is very important because, like I said, a lot of the textbooks that are out there are just flat out wrong. I mean, and they don't even talk about it. Um, it's, it's an area where there's still a lot of um, discovery and there's still uh, a lot of... Um, uh, knowledge and research that needs to be done. So I wanted to present some cases. So, and again, this is 15 years of experience I have. I've had every single complication you can think of doing lateral. Um, and so these are more challenging cases, but I think also, I think it illustrates the power of, of going lateral um, and what you can do. So this was a 75-year-old uh, patient who had, I think, eight, um, lumbar laminectomies. His last one, he ended up getting meningitis, CSF leak, and um, he was referred to me. And uh, this is what his um, imaging looked like. I'm sorry that the, the uh, MRI didn't look that great, but you can see they basically have taken almost all his facet joints. He's got really no uh, posterior structure. So, and to go from the back again for the ninth time. Um, and uh, he'd had uh, a lot of abdominal procedures, so doing an A-lift was not really an option. Um, and so this is where uh, I think Mark talked about this, is, you know, when you're working someone up, you know, it's really important. So when you get an MRI, when you get a CT scan, the patient's laying flat, right? But this is what it looks like when they're upright. So... One thing is a neurosurgeon, we tend to forget orthopedic surgeons are much smarter than us. They will order x-rays before they see the patient, not everyone. Most of my partners, including Jens, will, it's like a rule, you can't see the patient until you get x-rays. And this is a good example of, of, of how, you know, patients can have, you know, their MRIs actually look fairly benign, and then you get them upright, and this is what they look like. So you can see there's a significant, significant amount of instability there. Um, and this is, this is again, um, this is on flexion extension. So it's important to get dynamic imaging. So you can see how much it changed uh, just from having a patient 
flex and extend. So, you know, this is a patient who's had multiple surgeries. Do you do a long construct? Do you do something short? Um, if you can do lateral surgery, I think this is a good case um, for lateral procedure because you're going through a virgin area. Um, and so you're not going to, you know, the crest looks okay. Um, and I think you can get fairly decent um, implants in. This is what we ended up doing for the patient. Um, and uh, again, um, the dissection going, po we ended up, obviously you have to back this up posteriorly, but this is a case where, you know, you can see how nice and um, you, with indirect decompression, you get pretty good alignment. He's, he's 75 years old. You're not going to do a massive um, operation on him. And then here's, you know, his images. Now, I think this was uh, two or three years post-op. And what's interesting, and, I, and I, I've seen this happen a lot, is a lot of times when you look at the CTs on these cases, the implants are so large that sometimes you don't get a f solid fusion. So you really have to do a, a good, you have to try to really clean the end plates off. But a lot of times in some of these cases, the fusion actually happens posteriorly. So don't forget to decorticate the facet joints and do a good fusion. This guy did not have one sprinkle of bone go, th go through those peak cages, and he, he fused um, posteriorly. So it's interesting because, you know, if you do a T-lift and it doesn't fuse, you get a lot more subsidence and you're able to see things there. I think because of the fact that there's so, so much surface area that it doesn't subside as much. Um, when you go lateral. And then this is another um, case I thought would be interesting to show you guys. This was an 84-year-old who had AIS surgery, multiple, you know, different procedures. She had rhizotomies. She had, and the only complaint she had was like an L3 radiculopathy. It was the only complaint. And um, she never wanted to have another spine procedure. She had, I think it was a Triner's Hospital in a cast for a year. But her leg pain was so excruciating. And this, once again, the orthopedic surgeons are so smart. I never fully believed in indirect decompression until I started doing lateral. And you can see the... Um, on the sagittal view there, you can see the neural frame and you can see how compressed it is. And again, 84 years old, are you going to do a huge corrective procedure? Probably not. The main complaint was she had the radiculopathy. And so this is an extremely challenging case, but at the same time, you can see she's fused in her lower lumbar spine and uh, in her thoracic spine, but she has this severe deformity, um, at coronal deformity and uh, radiculopathy. So I proposed going lateral, um, and then here's the intraoperative images, and you can see we got very good um, distraction of the, of the uh, inner space. And here's what it looked like. You can see the foramen is now open. And again, it's not perfect, right? She's 84, um, but her leg pain was gone the next morning. And I had a, um, and it was staged. I had a hell of a time having her come back and for her to do the posterior part. I mean, her pain was gone immediately. And you can see, let me go back. Look at the difference between that and this image, right? <clears throat> and that's when I really started to believe in the power of going lateral. You know, you could never do this from a posterior approach. It would be so difficult. Um, and she's 84, you know, it took us less than two hours. She went home the next morning and, um, again, I brought her back and did the post here, but you can see, again, it's not perfect, but it's, it's a pretty darn good, um, uh, correction for someone her age. And, and the most important thing is her pain was gone. So one of the things I think Mark talked about, and I don't want to overemphasize is, as neurosurgeons, as orthopedic surgeons, we get focused on the MRIs, but you really have to get good x-rays on these patients. If you're gonna do MIS surgery, you're gonna do lateral, you're gonna be doing a big deformity procedure, and you can, you can see what a difference there is between the x-ray um, and the MRI. So if you're gonna do a lateral procedure on someone like this, 
you know, you have to understand the levels, you have to understand the uh, crest in relation to where you're gonna go, because this is what it looks like during surgery. And you can see, actually, this is a very good illustration of, you can get the crest to move a little bit. You know, you break the table, you tape the leg down, you try to pull the, the crest down, but it's not gonna move a lot. And you can see, I'm trying to do the L45 level, and the crest barely moved after all the stuff that I just talked to you about. So we're at like a 60 degree angle trying to get this inner body in. And when I booked this surgery, I knew she had this um, you know, high iliac crest, but I didn't fully appreciate it. And I, it's only when you get someone in that position. And fortunately, we were able to get to it, and we had our schedule to do more levels. But these are the kind of things you, you try. And when I first started doing lateral, we didn't have the angled instruments. The neuromonitoring wasn't great. In fact, I remember I was so nervous. I used a microscope, and I would go down, and every single fiber I would look at to make sure there wasn't a nerve in there. Um, and uh, over time, now all the companies have, um, you know, all these great angled instruments. And again, when you're doing lateral surgery, this is the retractor. Um, you can see we had to adjust the C arm to in order to see that disc space because it's so angled. So you really have to understand the three dimensional. Uh, relationships that I talked to you about earlier, and um, understand you know what where you are, and and it's very easy to go anterior, and to not get in the disc space. It's easy to get into the end plates, so all these issues become a factor. And early on, you know we would I would try to put as the biggest cage as I could. You get a lot of subsidence. You learn, you know sometimes it's it's good to not necessarily. Um, try to do too much and to respect the end plates. Um, this is another example of, you know, if you, if you're, if you get good at doing lateral surgery, um, you can do revisions, you can fish cages out, you can take out old implants. So this is a, I was on call and one, one of my partners did a um, T lift on a patient and uh, got a CSF leak, had a hard time controlling it, patient got a lumbar drain, and then the patient fell um, and had other issues, came back to the ER, and they got a CT scan, um, and then they found that the cage had went a little bit posterior. And so um, fortunately for my, for my partner, he was out of town. And so um, I was like, gosh, you know, she, and she was morbidly obese. Okay, so do you go back in from the back and then try to go through this mess of, you know, dura and everything that's there and it's finally healed? I was prepared to do that, but I was like, you know, maybe we can fish this out from a lateral approach. And um, I was a little nervous um, doing this. And uh, I thought I could potentially dislodge it posterior, but we were able to, you know, get in. I used a cob, and then um, the company at the time uh, had this little nice little kit, and we had all these different things in there. And one of them was a little hook, so we were able to get a little hook underneath the cage, and then I used an osteotome to try to loosen the cage, um, and we were able to get it out, and then. What is, the, what is the one other thing um, uh, that you guys notice on this AP x-ray? Exactly. So the screw, for whatever reason, had fractured out. Okay? So um, we didn't mess with that. We left it alone. Um, and But we were able to fish out this cage. But I was prepared to go posterior if I needed to. And then as I got more confident doing these cases, um, uh, you know, I started looking at doing tumor cases. You know, can you do tumors? Can you take out vertebral bodies from a lateral approach? So this is an L4 tumor that I took out from a lateral approach. And you can see how nice and uh, 
uh, of a corpectomy you can do. Um, and again, um, this is after years of learning and understanding um, all these anatomical relationships. And you guys are going to go in the lab and do some of this stuff. And once I got comfortable, you know, doing the low lumbar spine, then I started to move up and I started to do burst fractures. You know, can you go in thoracolumbar junction, do burst fractures, and you don't have to have an access surgeon. You don't have to. I remember, you know, we used to do these shark bite incisions, and it was so annoying because the thoracic surgeons would do this massive incision, and then you would use, like, maybe 10% of it. And then you could see, you know, you cut the diaphragm, you get in the chest, you'd have to have a chest tube, and here, and then it would be all based on the CT surgeon's schedule, right? So you're making an incision at like five o'clock at night, um, you know, six weeks out. So, and we're on this campus, which is a cardiac and uh, neuro hospital, but we, it was so hard to get the cardiac guys. They have no interest in doing these cases. And again, at the time, you know, it's like we're using cardiac instruments for a neuro-ortho spine procedure. So that's another reason to, um, to do lateral. And then um, once I got more comfortable, you know, your incisions get smaller, you understand the relationships. You, for example, I always now take a rib. You know, you get a very beautiful exposure. There's very little blood loss. Um, and you can get a very nice um, uh, corpectomy. You can get a very nice cage in there. Uh, we, we're in the process of publishing our um, uh, corpectomy series. And then here's, for example, another case, morbidly obese patient who had a fusion, then had this construct and had kyphoplasty. And you can see, you know, the, you need to get some anterior column support. Um, so I went in, we took out the screws and then did a lateral procedure and then uh, came back later and then extended her up. And then here's a, um, I was able to, um, I want to show you guys what the difference is in the incision, right? So this was 15 years ago. This is one of Dave Hanscom's exposures um, down here. So the patient was in the hospital for three months. Um, and then that's my exposure. So if you're a patient, which one would you rather have, the Hanscom or the Scullion? Um And you can see, I mean, that's the size of the incision you need to make. So compared to that, you know, it's, I'd much rather have that tiny little incision. And that's literally the size of that incision there. Um, and again, you can do initially, um, you know, uh, I was, I was like, well, you know, I would, I, I wasn't sure if I could go posterior and actually you can get the bone fragment out very nicely from the front on a case like this. And I would turn the retractor around and then I would get a microscope and it's just like you would do a corpectomy, um, open, you find the, um, transverse process. Um, the uh, uh, neural foramen, you go back posteriorly, you can see everything beautifully. Um, and you're able to get a fracture like this and, um, and get a very nice reduction. So um, it's, a, it's a great approach. And this is another case, actually Jens and I did. Jens, you remember this case? Oh, yes. Um, and, you know, again, this lady had an incision um, she, I think she had the uh, surgery, you know, like maybe a year. She, her incision was super in the front. She had this huge abdominal hernia from the previous incision. And so we went posterior. And I think, um, you know, you can see we basically went in posterior to where they went. Um, and I was able to cut the cage in half. And you can see the nice size um, corpectomy graph that we were able to put in. Um, and again, we, um, very little blood loss. We didn't even have to take any of the uh, uh, structures in the chest down and got a great uh, reconstruction. Um, and I actually love doing lateral for thoracic uh, uh, discs. 
So this is a patient um, who'd had multiple attempts to have this calcified thoracic disc taken out, and she was getting worse. And her brother was actually an orthopedic surgeon. The last time they did this, um, she woke up paralyzed, and she was starting to get worse and worse and worse. And you can see, actually, the, um, the thoracic, this is the, the disc right here. It goes all the way. It's, it's almost like it's basically part of the spinal cord. And so, you know, do you want to go back in a fifth time on someone posteriorly? And so I, I said to myself, well, what if you could go lateral and just cut behind the disc and have the disc, not even try to take out the calcified disc portion of it, and just have the disc flo uh, float forward? And that's kind of what we did. So you can see here, I basically went lateral I cut out the posterior wall of the, and I didn't even try to take out the calcified disc, but you can see it's already moved anterior. And she actually woke up without a deficit. It was incredible. I mean, you know, for me to do something like this from the back, very difficult. Um, and this is where, again, you kind of have to use your judgment, but, you know, she really didn't need an inner body. Um, but she did need some posterior fixation. So we did go back in um, and, and tried to pull her back uh, some because she was pretty kyphotic from all the laminectomy she, she had. But you can see there's my retractor. And I actually, when I'm in the chest I, and I'm going posterior to the cord, I like to stand um, on the opposite side. So I'm, I like to stand on the patient's abdominal side looking back towards the cord. And you can see there's a bayonet forcep, um, and I'm measuring how much uh, uh, the uh, uh, end plates I've removed. But I could see all the way across to the other side. Um, and again, very little blood loss. I think this case maybe took me two hours to do. Um, did need an access surgeon. Didn't have to put a chest tube in. Um, and the patient did great. but. Um, again, this is after, you know, doing a lot of these different procedures. And for tumors, this is a great case because most of these cancer patients, you know, they've had radiation, they've had chemo. Uh, going in from the back is kind of a nightmare. Um, a lot of them, you know, they're kind of tired and burned out. But sometimes they'll have one lesion in their spine and, the, you know, the rest of, especially nowadays, you know, renal cell, breast cancer, you know, these patients are living longer and longer. So what if you can go after a lesion like this um, and do it la uh, doing, it, doing it laterally, and there's a significant amount of retropulsion, you can see, you know, we're not going to get, sometimes we don't get every single piece of tumor out, but this patient has metastasis. You've just given this patient, you know, another two, three years with good quality of life with a very small procedure. Um, and she previously had had the posterior done, um, and this was a recurrence. So again, it's a great, um, it's a very slick operation. There's a patient, um, actually Jens and I operated on, who had, uh, was like 10 years out from renal cell, had this one lesion, um, and uh, uh, Jens um, went in posterior, and then I went anterior, um, and the patient did great. And um, last but not least, I'm going to put a little plug in for our book. Um, this is 15 years worth of work that uh, we did, um, and uh, uh, there's hundreds of uh, cases and anatomical uh, pictures and diagrams. We tried to make it um, accurate. Um, as we can, and um, it's, I think, uh, for me, it's, a, like I said, it's continuing to evolve as we understand and learn more. Um, uh, to me, it's still a very exciting space, and, you know, I'm excited about, you know, prone lateral, um, all these other cool things that are going on. You know, Dr. Pimenta continues to push the envelope, and then this is a um, picture of my daughter's so um, I'm really proud of my kids, um, and uh, we live in the Northwest, so um, we're uh, always doing stuff with our daughters, and I love going to Montana. Um, this is a nice picture of my girls in Montana, so thank you so much.
Great job, Rod, um, as always. So for those who follow rugby, by the way, the Springboks won the rubber match. It's, uh, it was a really tight game, so congrats to the box and the Lions lost. But um, <clears throat> uh, for far lateral surgeries, again, I've asked this question before, but I mm -hmm. want you to share your thoughts with the group. What do you tell patients in terms of what to expect for hip flexion and knee extension weakness and numbness and tingling? How often does it happen? How often does it not come back? So the numbness, I tell them 100%. They all wake up with their, their thigh being numb. Um, they'll have some weakness because you're going through the psoas. And, um, you know, most of these are temporary. Uh, fortunately, they don't last forever. I do put these patients on gabapentin, a lot of them, for six weeks. I think that tends to help. Um, it's interesting because I've never fully understood, and I think Luis and I and, and some of the other people, David and, and um, Juan have talked about this. I don't fully understand the weakness. I think it's a combination of inflammation of the psoas, the retraction on the lumbar plexus, um, because some patients don't have that weakness, but some have a pretty profound weakness. And, um, but almost 100%, I would say, have the thigh numbness. And then another final question before we have to move on. And maybe I'll ask you to introduce our next speaker then, the Nuge. Um, left versus right in terms of degenerative scolies and concavity versus convexity. So uh, we've had many discussions about this. Give us your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I've kind of, um, I used to go all on the uh, con, um, uh, cavity, then I went on the convexity, I uh, used to go back and forth, but now I just, I try to do everything from the left side. Um, that's my preference. Um, I had a bad uh, colon injury going in from the right, so you have to understand, you know, like the, the colon is a retroperitoneal structure down low, um, and you can, things like that can't get in the way, and um, but that's just been, you know, that's, it's more for me also too, just the way, um, in the OR, just the room set up and how I have it. Um, and I, again, you know, we used to have like these coronal taper cages and things like that, but now I just basically, I think I just prefer going in from the left. <laughs> 